Spheres of Influence It's the end of 2022, and both political parties of the United States of America have conspired to get us into a war with Russia. It makes me think that if Mike Wallace, Ed Bradley, Harry Reasoner, and Morley Safer of 60 Minutes were still around, they would be watching this spectacle of the president of Ukraine showing up to the United States Senate asking for billions of free money and the 1980s cast of 60 Minutes would be asking questions. They would be asking, before Russia sent in the tanks, was Ukraine negotiating with Russia? What were the disagreements? What did Ukraine want? What did Russia want? What were they willing to offer in exchange? And who broke down the talks? You see, here in America, the fusion between the federal government and the American news media is complete. Instead of asking questions like this, our American news media, such as MSNBC, is asking which senators did not applaud like trained seals at the speech of the Ukrainian president. These are questions any investigative reporter from the early 80s would be asking. But the fact is, I'm not a trained journalist. That means my opinion carries no more weight than yours. But what I can do is research, and I've pulled up a number of clips dating back to 2007 showing how Ukraine, Russia, the United States, and Europe have led us into a land war with the world's largest country armed with nuclear warheads. First, let's go back to 2007. I have two different clips showing Vladimir Putin objecting to NATO plans for Ukraine. President NATO Sir, Secretary Minister. General Yapta Hope Skeffer opened the session with brief public remarks. He noted it has been six years since the establishment of the NATO-Russia Council to deal with issues between the alliance and Moscow. Today our relations are truly multifaceted influenced both by political realities and issues on which we differ, as well as by practical and very pragmatic common interests. And then the news media was ushered out and the doors were closed. Mr. Putin later said he is pleased with the discussions, but noted certain problems, such as Russia's objections to U.S. anti-missile defense plans in Central Europe and continued NATO expansion. The declaration that this process is not directed against Russia cannot satisfy us. National security cannot be built on promises. On Thursday, NATO endorsed the missile defense plan. The Western Military Alliance also turned down a bid by Georgia and Ukraine to be put on an immediate path to membership, but declared it wants to bring the two former Soviet republics into the fold at some point in the future. Just hours before President Putin met with summit leaders, the alliance discussed the outlook for eventual membership with Ukrainian President Viktor Yushchenko. Secretary General Skeffer assured him that Ukraine and Georgia will eventually be put on the path to NATO membership. He noted NATO foreign ministers will revisit the issue in December. There was a, a clear signal and a decision yesterday that the aspirations for membership action plan are supported. As the NATO summit wrapped up in Romania, leaders welcomed Russian President Vladimir Putin to speak. He's been clear about his opposition to NATO membership for Ukraine and Georgia. The former Soviet republics had hoped for a green light from the alliance to start the process toward membership. Instead, NATO put the offer on hold. Secretary General Yaptehub Skeffer says the two countries will eventually be a part of NATO. But I stand to be corrected if the sentence we agreed today that these countries in the text read Ukraine and Georgia, will become members of, of, of NATO, leaves, leaves a shimmer of a doubt. Not, not, not in my opinion. The Northern Alliance also okayed missile defense plans for Europe that call for systems to be built in Poland and the Czech Republic. That's another alliance move that Putin strongly opposes. Vladimir Putin then addressed these concerns in his own words at the Munich Security Conference that year. Transcript 2007 Putin speech. It is well known that international security comprises much more than issues relating to military and political stability. It involves the stability of the global economy, overcoming poverty, 
Economic Security and Developing a Dialogue Between Civilizations As Franklin D. Roosevelt said during the first few days that the Second World War was breaking out, when peace has been broken anywhere, the peace of all countries everywhere is in danger. It turns out that NATO has put its frontline forces on our borders, and we continue to strictly fulfill the treaty obligations and do not react to these actions at all. I think it is obvious that NATO expansion does not have any relation with the modernization of the alliance itself or with ensuring security in Europe. On the contrary, it represents a serious provocation that reduces the level of mutual trust, and we have the right to ask, against whom is this expansion intended? And what happened to the assurances our Western partners made after the dissolution of the Warsaw Pact? Where are those declarations today? No one even remembers them. But I will allow myself to remind this audience what was said. I would like to quote the speech of NATO General Secretary Mr. Warner in 1990. He said at the time, the fact that we are ready not to place a NATO army outside of German territory gives the Soviet Union a firm security guarantee. Where are these guarantees? For 15 years prior to 2006, as long as we did not make the corresponding decisions during our difficult talks, deliveries of Russian energy and, first and foremost, of gas to Europe depended on the conditions and prices for the deliveries of Russian gas to Ukraine itself, and this was something that Ukraine and Russia agreed amongst themselves. And if we reached no agreement, then all European consumers would sit there with, with no gas. Would you like to see this happen? Regarding our perception of NATO's eastern expansion, I already mentioned the guarantees that were made and that are not being observed today. Do you think that this is normal practice in international affairs? But all right, forget it. Forget these guarantees. With respect to democracy and NATO expansion, NATO is not a universal organization as opposed to the UN. It is first and foremost a military and political alliance, military and political. Well, ensuring one's own security is the right of any sovereign state. We are not arguing this. This is Stephen Cohen speaking about a sphere of influence. And when you see references to a sphere of influence made by Russia and the United States, pay attention because both sides are using this terminology but one side, that being NATO, is ignoring whether Russia has any claim to any sphere of influence at all. NATO expansion is not over for the Russians. It's a reality. NATO's sitting on its borders. It's not about future NATO expansion. It's about current. Uh, NATO expansion represents the following to Russia. And on the, near this, I will end. It represents a profoundly broken promise to Russia made by the first Bush that in return for United Germany and NATO, NATO would not expand eastward. This is, this is beyond any dispute. People say, well, they never signed a treaty. But a deal is a deal. The United States gives its word unless we're shysters. And if you don't get it in writing, we'll cheat you. We broke our word. And when both Putin and Medvedev say publicly to Madeleine Albright and others, we, Russia, feel deceived and betrayed, that's what they're talking about. So NATO represents on the part of Russia a lack of trust. You break your words to us. What can, to what extent can we trust you? Secondly, it represents military encirclement. If you, look, if you sit in the Kremlin and you look out at where NATO is and where they want to go, it's everywhere. It's everywhere on Russia's borders. But there's something even more profound that's a taboo in the United States. Uh, NATO expansion represents for the Russians American hypocrisy and a dual standard. And they see it this way, and I can't think of any way to deny their argument. The expansion of NATO is the expansion of the American sphere of influence. Plain and simple. Where NATO goes, our military force goes. Where NATO goes, uh, our arms munitions go because they have to buy American weapons. Where NATO goes, Western soldiers go who date their women. Uh, they bring along their habits and all the other things. It's clearly 
undebatably, indisputably, an expansion of America's sphere of influence. So there has been a tremendous expansion of America's sphere of influence since the mid-1990s, right plunk on Russia's borders. All the while, every administration, American administration, saying to Russia, including the Obama administration, you cannot have a sphere of influence because that's old thinking. Well, I mean, the Russians may be cruel, but they're not stupid. In other words, what they say is we can now have the biggest sphere of influence the world's ever seen, and you don't get any, not even on your own border. In fact, we're taking what used to be your traditional sphere of influence, along with the energy and all the rest. It's ours now. Again, this idea of a winner-take-all policy. This is the enormous uh, resentment in Russia. The relationship will never become a stable cooperative relationship until we deal with this problem. So the Russians viewed NATO and the West as seeking to replace Russia's sphere of influence with their own. This would have deadly consequences in 2014, when Russia, seeing weakness on the Obama-Biden administration, invaded Crimea and threatened the rest of Ukraine. Putin finally got the West's attention. The Obama administration gave this light, trivial assignment to the right man, Joe Biden. Los Angeles Times, here is what Joe Biden actually did in Ukraine. This article was written some years after 2014, but it sums up what Biden's responsibilities were. Biden's interest in the region goes back to his first term in the Senate in the 1970s, and after the Soviet Union collapsed in 1991, he directed attention to former Soviet states, including Ukraine, arguing they be allowed to join NATO. After Russian troops seized and occupied the Crimean Peninsula in the spring of 2014, Ukraine rose to the top of the Obama administration agenda. Obama outsourced the portfolio to his vice president. Now remember, Joe Biden was also handed the assignment by Obama of handling Iraq. The direct result of Joe Biden handling Iraq was the complete withdrawal of American troops from the area and the creation of the Islamic State, which killed many, many, many people. And this is the same man Obama tasked with Ukraine. On one trip in February 2014, Biden watched anti-government protesters fill the streets of Kiev in what would became known as the Maidan Revolution. Within months, the pro-Russian government was ousted and replaced with pro-Western leaders. Biden warned that the Ukraine could not be seen as a basket case or allies would lose patience, and then you'd be screwed and left at the mercy of Moscow, a former aide recalled Biden telling the Ukrainians. Few have doubts that Hunter Biden was offered a lucrative position on the board of Burisma Holdings, a natural gas company, because of his father's prominence. It's common in Eastern Europe to hire a relative of a senior official to burnish a company's image and to help shield it from official or unofficial shakedowns. When you're having these conversations with European allies who are very concerned about these sanctions, how do you justify that? And what are your plans? 120 make? days. Give me a break. Need time. <laughs> In December 2015, Biden gave an impassioned address to the Rada, the Ukraine parliament, to condemn the scourge of corruption. Here's Biden doing a joint session with the Ukraine president at the time. Flagrant violation of the bedrock principles of our international system, which is why the international community has responded with one voice, amplifying your voice, Mr. President, the voice of all Ukrainians, helping Ukrainians defend their sovereignty and their security, the security of your nation. The international community condemning Russian actions, expanding security assistance to Ukraine, imposing greater and greater cost on Russia for its illegal actions, and refusing, refusing to accept the so-called elections held by separatists on November the 2nd. It was signed not long ago by Russia. And so long as that continues, Russia will face rising costs, greater isolation, 
united in our commitment to impose tough economic sanctions on Russia. And while Russian aggression persists, the cost imposed on Moscow will continue to rise. The Corruption Bureau and establish a special prosecutor fighting corruption. The Office of the General Prosecutor desperately needs reform. The judiciary should be overhauled. The energy sector needs to be competitive, ruled by market principles, not sweetheart deals. Corruption siphons away resources and the people, it blunts the economic growth, and it affronts the human dignity. The United States is with you in this fight. And I was going, supposed to announce that there is another billion dollar loan guarantee. And I had gotten a commitment from Poroshenko and from uh, Yatsenyuk that they would take action against the state prosecutor, and they didn't. So they said they had, they were walking out to press conference, said, no, nah. I said, I'm not going to, or we're not going to give you the billion dollars. They said, you have no authority. You're not the president. The president said, I said, call him. <laughs> I said, I'm telling you, you're not getting the billion dollars. I said, you're not getting the billion. I'm going to be leaving here. And I think it was, what, six hours. I looked, I said, I'm leaving in six hours. If the prosecutor's not fired, you're not getting the money. Well, son of a bitch. <laughs> got fired. And they put in place someone who was solid at the time. The principles that would guide our administration, the fundamental elements of American foreign policy under the Obama-Biden administration. And what I said then, I will repeat now. I said, we will not recognize any nation having a sphere of influence. Sovereign states have the right to make their own decisions and choose their own alliances, period. Period. In the 21st century, nations cannot and we cannot allow them to redraw borders by force. Biden's comments on a sphere of influence. Biden does not see NATO as a sphere of influence. It's weird how the applause is cut and the speech resumes at a different point, both in the video and the official transcript. Listen to it again and read the official transcript. I said we will not recognize any nation having a sphere of influence. Sovereign states have the right to make their own decisions and choose their own alliances, period. Period. In the 21st century, nations cannot and we cannot allow them to redraw borders by force. Did Biden start talking about NATO at that point? We'll never know. We don't have a news media that asks questions. Cost imposed on Moscow will continue to rise. The false propaganda that the Kremlin is disseminating in an attempt to undermine Ukraine and fracture Europe's resolve will not work. No one should mistake saber rattling and bombast for strength. Let me say that again. No one should mistake saber rattling and bombast for real strength. We're taking steps to bolster Europe's resilience to Russian coercive tactics. We are strengthening NATO as I speak, improving energy security as I speak, and attempting to help spur an economic revival throughout Europe. So there we have it from Biden's perspective. Bringing Ukraine into NATO's sphere of influence will reduce Russia's power and enhance the power of the West. This is precisely what Putin was threatening to go to war over. This is Joe Biden speaking at the Munich Security Conference. To reasserting the fundamental bedrock principles on which European freedom and stability rest. And I'll say it again, inviolate borders, no spheres of influence, the sovereign right to choose your own alliances. But President Putin has to make a simple, stark choice. Get out of Ukraine or face continued isolation and growing economic costs at home. But as the story of Ukraine shows, there are multiple dimensions to European security. Hard military power of NATO for sure, but also confronting corruption that's being used as a tool to undermine national sovereignty in other parts of Europe.
Corruption is a cancer. If the prosecutor's not fired, you're not getting the money. Oh, son of a bitch. <laughs> got fired. Let me state as clearly as I can what is not our objective. It is not the objective of the United States, I repeat, it is not the objective of the United States of America to collapse or weaken the Russian economy. That is not our objective. That's Vice President Biden's stance in 2014 and 2015. Let's go to an op-ed column written by former Secretary of State Henry Kissinger. The test of policy is how it ends, not how it begins. Far too often, the Ukrainian issue is posed as a showdown, whether Ukraine joins the East or the West. But if Ukraine is to survive and thrive, it must not be either side's outpost against the other. It should function as a bridge between them. Russia must accept that to try to force Ukraine into a satellite status and thereby move Russia's borders again would doom Moscow to repeat its history of self-fulfilling cycles of reciprocal pressures with Europe and the United States. The West must understand that to Russia, Ukraine can never be just a foreign country. Russia history began in what was called Kievan Rus. The Russian religion spread from here. Ukraine has been part of Russia for centuries, and their histories were intertwined before then. Some of the most important battles for Russian freedom were fought on Ukrainian soil. Even such famed dissidents as Solzhenitsyn and Joseph Brodsky insisted that Ukraine was an integral part of Russian history and indeed of Russia. The European Union must recognize that its bureaucratic dilatoriness and subordination of the strategic element to domestic politics in negotiating Ukraine's relationship to Europe contributed to turning a negotiation into a crisis. Foreign policy is the art of establishing priorities. The Ukrainians are the decisive element. They live in a country with a complex history. Crimea, 60% of whose population is Russian, became part of Ukraine only in 1954. The west of Ukraine is largely Catholic. The east of Ukraine is largely Russian Orthodox. The west speaks Ukrainian. The east speaks mostly Russian. Any attempt by one wing of Ukraine to dominate the other would lead eventually to civil war or break up. To treat Ukraine as part of an east-west confrontation would scuttle for decades any prospect to bring Russia and the West into a cooperative international system. Ukraine has been independent for only 23 years. Not surprisingly, its leaders have not learned the art of compromise, even less of historical perspective. A wise U.S. policy towards Ukraine would seek a way for the two parts of the country to cooperate with each other. We should seek reconciliation, not the domination of a faction. Russia and the West have not acted on this principle. Each has made the situation worse. Again, this is in 2014. For the West, the demonization of Vladimir Putin is not a policy. It is an alibi for the absence of one. Those words go straight to the administration and leadership of Joseph R. Biden in 2022. The demonization of Vladimir Putin is not a policy. It is an alibi for the absence of one. For its part, the United States needs to avoid treating Russia as an aberrant to be patiently taught rules of conduct established by Washington. Putin is a serious strategist on the premises of Russian history. Understanding U.S. values and psychology are not his strong suits. Leaders of all sides should return to examining outcomes, not compete in posturing. Here is Henry Kissinger's advice in 2014, obviously ignored, but let's look at his points. 1. Ukraine should have the right to choose freely its economic and political associations, including with Europe. 2. Ukraine should not join NATO. This is key. President Donald Trump was impeached over precisely his desire that Ukraine not join NATO. 4. It is incompatible with the rules of the existing world order for Russia to annex Crimea. Well, they did, and nobody stopped them. When Russia saw the weakness of the Obama-Biden administration when they invaded Crimea, they obviously decided that Obama-Biden would not offer serious opposition in future conflicts. Henry Kissinger's advice was largely followed by President Trump, but not by the Obama or Biden administrations. This brings us to 2019. The State Department testified during Adam Schiff's impeachment hearings that they were continuing the foreign policy of the Obama-Biden administration in Ukraine. 
These officials considered it an interruption to their work to have Donald Trump elected. This attitude was conveyed by testimonial statements of Ukraine Ambassador Marie Yovanovitch and Light Colonel Vindman. These unelected officials decided their foreign policy needed to be implemented, not Donald Trump's. And when Donald Trump interrupted their work, they went to Democrats in the House of Representatives, specifically Adam Schiff, to help block Donald Trump from his legal authority to conduct foreign policy. Let's look at Yovanovitch's policies before the hearings, as she stated at the Maritime Security Conference. November 29, 2018, the United States supports Ukraine's right to do so, and we will continue to stand with the people of Ukraine against Russian aggression. At several Ukrainian naval sites, we're helping with a forward naval presence in the Black Sea coordinated with NATO. It comes to about 250 days annually of U.S. or NATO presence in the Black Sea. And, of course, we are proud to have also provided some assistance in developing the naval strategy that is featured and announced at this conference. These steps and others, I think, demonstrate the seriousness of our commitment, and we are currently considering additional ways the United States might assist Ukraine to further develop its maritime capacity. Now from Ambassador Yovanovitch's opening statement, remember she had just been fired by President Donald Trump once he learned that she was conducting Obama-Biden foreign policy unnoticed. Supporting Ukraine's integration into Europe and combating Russia's efforts to destabilize Ukraine have anchored U.S. policy since the Ukrainian people protested in 2014 and demanded to be a part of Europe and live according to the rule of law. That was U.S. policy when I was appointed ambassador in August 2016, and it was reaffirmed as the policy of the current administration in early 2017. Now this paragraph is highly politically charged. Ambassador Yovanovitch, who has just been fired by President Donald Trump, is stating here that it was her job to continue the foreign policy of Obama-Biden and that Donald Trump, elected by voters in 2016's election, was interrupting her good work. The will of the voters and the will of the new commander-in-chief, Donald Trump, did not apply to her. Her job was to continue Democrat foreign policy regardless of whether foolish voters put in a Republican into office. ...and partnerships that buttresses our own strength. Ukraine, with an enormous landmass and a large population, has the potential to be a significant commercial and political partner for the United States, as well as a force multiplier on the security side. We see the potential in Ukraine. Russia sees, by contrast, sees the risk. The history is not written yet, but Ukraine could move out of Russia's orbit. And now, Ukraine is a battleground for great power competition, with a hot war for the control of territory and a hybrid war to control Ukraine's leadership. The U.S. has provided significant security assistance since the onset of the war against Russia in 2014. And the Trump administration strengthened our policy by approving the provision to Ukraine of anti-tank missiles known as javelins. In Ukraine is the right thing to do. It's also the smart thing to do. If Russia prevails and Ukraine falls to Russian dominion, we can expect to see other attempts by Russia to expand its territory and its influence. As critical as the war against Russia is, Ukraine's struggling democracy has an equally important challenge, battling the Soviet legacy of corruption, which is the U.S. will inevitably have to use other tools even more than it does today. And those other tools are blunter, more expensive, and not universally effective. Moreover, the attacks are leading to a crisis in the State Department as the policy process is visibly unraveling. Leadership vacancies go unfilled, and senior and mid-level officers ponder an uncertain future. The crisis has moved from the impact on individuals to an impact on the institution itself. The State Department is being hollowed out from within at a competitive and complex time on the world stage. This is not a time to undercut our diplomats. 
It is the responsibility of the department's leaders to stand up for the institution and the individuals who make that institution still today the most effective diplomatic force in the world. Finally, we have Lieutenant Colonel Vindman of the State Department. When the voters elected a new president with a new foreign policy, bureaucrats like Vindman took it upon themselves, in their own words, to block the foreign policy of the new president. They ran right to the Democratic Party and said, help us impeach Donald Trump. And this effort was to abrogate the will of the voters who put President Donald Trump into office. In the spring of 2019, I became aware of two disruptive actors, primarily Ukraine's then prosecutor, Yuri Litsenko, and former Mayor Rudolf Giuliani, president's personal attorney, promoting false narratives that undermined the United States Ukraine policy. The NSC and its interagency partners, including the State Department, grew increasingly concerned about the impact that such information was having on our country's ability to achieve our national security objectives. On April 21st, 2019, Vladimir Zelensky was elected president of Ukraine in a landslide victory on a unity, reform, and anti-corruption platform. President Trump called President Zelensky on April 21st, 2019 to congratulate him on his victory. I was the staff officer who produced the call materials and was one of the staff officers who listened to the call. The call was positive and President Trump expressed his desire to work with President Zelensky and extended an invitation to visit the White House. In May, I attended the inauguration of President Zelensky as part of the presidential delegation led by Secretary Perry. Following the visit, the members of the delegation provided President Trump a debriefing offering a positive assessment of President Zelensky and his team. Because you know Ukraine, you know that we work through our allies and our multilateral relations, and you know that um, the Ukraine is an aspiring member of the EU and NATO, right, Ms. Williams? Yes, that's correct. Lieutenant Colonel Vindeman? Yes, correct. And you know that probably that the EU and the NATO and NATO both have offices in the Ukraine, and that we try to advance our policy with the EU and NATO, and you would agree that our Ambassador K. Bailey Hutchinson and Ambassador Sondland would be responsible for advancing our policy interests with Ukraine at the EU and at NATO. Right, Ms. Williams? I would say that certainly in terms of this specific relationship between NATO and Ukraine, that would, would fall to Ambassador Hutchison and between the EU and Ukraine uh, to Ambassador Sondland. But obviously we have an ambassador in Ukraine as well. Right. Lieutenant Colonel Vindeman, you would agree? I agree with uh, Ms. Williams. Great. Um, now, <clears throat> Lieutenant Colonel, you said in your written statement that Mayor Rudolf Giuliani um, promoted false information that undermined the United States Ukraine policy. Have you ever met Giuliani? Uh, just to be, again, accurate, I said false narrative just because uh, that's what I said in the record this morning, but okay. I have not met him. And so you've never had a conversation with him about Ukraine or been in a meeting where him, where, with him where he has spoken to others about Ukraine? Uh, no, just what I saw him, um, um, you know, his comments on TV. So news and reports. News, yes. And similarly, you've never met the President of the United States, right? That is correct. So you've never advised the President of the United States on Ukraine? Uh, I, I advised him indirectly. I made all his preparations for the calls. and. But you, you've engagements. never spoken to the President of the United States and, and told him advice on Ukraine? That is correct. So on, in your written statement, you said, in May I attended the inauguration of President Zelensky as part of the President delegation led by Secretary Perry. Following the visit, the members of the delegation provided President Trump a debriefing. Well, that's not really accurate, right? Because the members didn't, because you were a member, but you weren't in that meeting, were you? That is correct. Okay, so we'll just have a note there that that, that meeting occurred without you. Now, you do know that this impeachment inquiry is about the President of the United States, don't you, Lieutenant Colonel I, I, I do, Representative. Excellent. Now, you've said that you're responsible for coordinating U.S.-Ukrainian policy. Correct. Does the Secretary of State Pompeo report to you? Uh, he does not. Ambassador Volker? He does not. We coordinate. Uh, Ambassador uh, of Ukraine, EU, NATO, Assistant Secretary for Europe, anyone at DOD report to you with respect to your responsibilities of, of coordinating U.S. policy with Ukraine? Congressman, at my level, I convene what's called a sub-policy coordinating committee. That's Deputy Assistant Secretary. I coordinate with, I chair those meetings. And Does I anybody those need votes. your approval in your role on Ukraine policy to formulate Ukraine policy? Do they seek your approval? According to the um, NSPM4, the policy signed by the president, uh, so he policy gets to should do be it. coordinated by the, he by gets the to NSC, it. correct? Um, 200, 201, in a colloquy with Mr. Stewart, 
You said, I would say, first of all, I'm the director for Ukraine. I'm responsible for Ukraine. I'm the most knowledgeable. And, and I'm there for the, the National Security Council and, and the White House. Are you the only one of, of the entire universe of our government or otherwise that can advise the president on Ukraine? Couldn't someone like Ms. Williams also advise on Ukraine? It's in her portfolio. That's not typically what would happen. It would be, fr frankly, it would be Ambassador Bolton. So, would other, be so other people can advise on Ukraine besides you. Uh, going on in your testimony, you said, I understand all the nuances, the context, and so forth surrounding these issues. I, on my judgment, went. I expressed concerns within the chain of command, which I think to me, as a military officer, is completely appropriate, and I exercised that chain of command. Lieutenant Colonel Vindman, your deposition, page 259, you said, I forwarded my concerns through the chain of command, and the seniors then decide the action to take. Mr. Morrison's your senior. He didn't know about it. How can he decide an action to take? But that's what you said. In Mr. Morrison's deposition, page 60, the question is, at what point did you learn that Lieutenant Colonel Vindman went to Eisenberg? He said, he said, about the 25th phone call? He said, yes, in the course of reviewing for this proceeding, reviewing the open record. So the quest, next question, so Eisenberg never came to you and relayed to you the conversation? He said, no. He said, Ellis never did either? Not to the best of my recollection. So Mr. Morrison was skipped in your chain of command about your other concerns. So Mr. Morrison said he's the final clearing authority. He said he saw your edits. Do you remember if all of the edits were incorporated? And he said, yes, I accepted all of them. That's on page 61, 62. So he believes all your edits were accepted. Let me ask you, were in your edits, did you insist that the word demand be put into the transcription between the conversation of the two presidents? I did not. But you did say that in your opening statement today. Thank you, and I yield back. Uh, much, much has been talked about, as we've discussed, between uh, the President Trump and President Belisky and the word favor, and this being interpreted as a basis for impeachment. And your interpretation of the word favor, and I'll paraphrase you, and you feel free to correct me, you said, in the military culture, which you and I are both familiar with, when a superior officer asks for a favor of a subordinate, they will interpret that as a demand. Is, is that a fair synopsis of what you previously stated? Representative, when a superior makes a request, that's an order. Okay. Uh, in short, then, you think your interpretation of a favor as a demand is based on your military experience and the military culture? I, I think that is correct. I think that is correct. Uh, is President Trump a member of the military? Uh, he is not. Has he ever served in the military? Uh, not that I'm aware of. Is President Zelensky a member of the military? Uh, I the don't believe no. so. I don't know. He's not. Would it be fair then to take a person who has never served in the military uh, and to take your reevaluation of their words based on your military experience and your military culture and to attach that culture and that meaning of those words to someone who has never served? Representative, I made that judgment. I stick by that judgment. Okay, well, I, I got to tell you, I think it's nonsense. Uh, look, I was in the military. I could distinguish between a favor and an order and a demand, and so could my subordinates. And I think President Zelensky did as well. He never initiated an investigation. In fact, he's been very clear. He said, I never felt any pressure at all. So you interpreted the word favor, but the two people who were speaking to each other did not. And explained to us why, in your mind, it was a demand. And you've given us reasons, a disparity of power between the two presidents. Uh, and because you did feel that way, you also felt that you had a duty to report what you thought was improper. Is that correct? That is correct. Okay. So two different people, two impartial observers, one felt the need to report the call because there was a demand that was improper and one that didn't report it to anyone. You didn't report it to anyone, right, Ms. Williams? I ensured that the information was available to my superiors. So while all this might seem as clear as mud, I think your honest and candid assessments of what you heard on the call tells us what we need to know. We have two independent folks, nonpartisans, and I'm not hearing a consensus between the two of you about 
what exactly you both heard on the call that you heard at the exact same time. And if you can't reach an agreement with regard to what happened on the call, how can any of us? An impeachment inquiry is supposed to be clear. It's supposed to be obvious. It's supposed to be overwhelming and compelling. And if two people on the call disagree honestly about whether or not there was a demand and whether or not anything should be reported on a call, that is not a clear and compelling basis to undo 63 million votes and remove a president from office. What's come out during this process is that we had two Ukraine policies. One was bipartisan and longstanding, and that was to assist Ukraine, which had freed, had freed itself from the domination of Russia, to fight corruption and to resist Russian aggression. Is that a fair statement, Colonel Vindman? I think that's a fair characterization, Congressman. And to give folks a reminder of the extent of corrupt corruption, by the way, a legacy of Putin's Ru Russia, is it your understanding that when their prior uh, pr uh, president, Mr. Yanukovych, fled to Russia into the arms of Mr. Putin, he took with him 30 to 40 billion dollars of that impoverished country? Those, uh, there are different estimates, but it's on that scale, yes. Vast scale for a poor country. And is it your understanding that powerless but motivated Ukrainians rose up in protest to this incredible graft and theft and abuse by their president? That is correct. And that was in the Maiden, it was called the Maiden Revolution, the Revolution of Dignity, correct? Correct. And young people went into that square in downtown Kyiv and demonstrated for months, correct? Correct. And, and 100 were, died. 106 young people died and older people died, correct? That was in, 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 in uh, between February 18, 2014, and February 22. Is that correct? Correct. 106 died, including people who were shot by snipers, kids. And Yanukovych had put snipers on the rooftops of buildings to shoot into that square and kill, murder, slaughter those young people. Is that your understanding? That is correct. In our bipartisan support, and by the way, I want to say to my Republican colleagues, a lot of leadership to have this bipartisan support came from your side. Thank you. But our whole commitment was to get rid of corruption and to stop that Russian aggression. Is that correct? That amounts to some of the key pillars. That's right. And the Giuliani, Sondman, and it appears Trump policy was not about that. It was about investigations into a political opponent, correct? I'll take that question back. We know it. And you know, I'll say this to President Trump. You want to investigate Joe Biden. You want to investigate Hunter Biden. Go at it. Do it. Do it hard. Do it dirty. Do it the way you do do it. Just don't do it by asking a foreign leader to help you in your campaign. That's your job, it's not his. My goal in these hearings is two things. One is to get an answer to Colonel Vindman's question. And the second coming out of this is for us as a Congress to return to the Ukraine policy that Nancy Pelosi and Kevin McCarthy both support. It's not investigations. It's the restoration of democracy in Ukraine and the resistance of Russian aggression. I yield back. So obviously this war is ongoing. I don't have any conclusions at the end of 2022 because it is a war, a land war with Russia run by Joseph R. Biden of the United States. So that means we will not have any end in sight to this war. And we have the real possibility of a nuclear exchange. And yet we have every Republican and Democrat in the Senate, for the most part, clapping like trained seals as they seal the deal 
to crush our nation's economy and to enter the world into another Great Depression, all to prove a point that Russia does not have a sphere of influence, that being Ukraine, and that they're going to move Ukraine into the European Union's market economy. And Russia's not stupid. They understand this completely. This is nothing more than a monopoly game to the United States, to the bureaucrats of the European Union, and to the bureaucrats running NATO. And when you see the, the American news media fully compliant with the American government, you have to ask, are we being told the truth? I'd think back to 60 Minutes back in 1982. They would have asked questions of the powerful, and they wouldn't have been accused of being Putin lovers for asking questions. So it should be at the end of 2022, as two sides fight to put Ukraine into their sphere of influence. Thank you.